All right, today we are welcoming one of the game's most known agents or managers. Uh, he's been in involved with some of the, the game's biggest names and colourful characters. Uh, David Riolo, welcome to the buy round. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> you, you, your voice tells it all, mate. You, uh, you sound thrilled. You sound, you sound over the moon. Um, you, you are a, a, a sports agent, but you, you did begin um, your career as a as a professional rugby league player. You played over a hundred games. How do you reflect on that, um, mate? I, I, had a, I had fun. It's fantastic. Got a lot of good friends, and the game's given me a lot. I um, I came into grade really early, came straight out of all the schoolboy systems and New South Wales pathways. And I debuted at, at 17 for the for the Illawarra Steelers in 1990. If I'm brutally honest, I didn't really achieve probably the heights I would have liked. Um, I, I retired at 26, had about 12 operations in the previous two years, come through Super League into leaving the Steelers, which was my home team. I had seven years there and then two at Parramatta. So if I'm brutally honest, I think my on myself, I haven't really really opened up about it, but I don't see my career as a great success. Yeah, but um, still, 100 games is... is yeah, is, but I... Is, is, you know, 100 more than a lot of other people. Oh, 100%, mate. I'm proud of that, and I'm proud that I did that in, in, in my hometown and in front of a lot of people, but I wanted to play for Australia. I wanted to play for New South Wales, and, you know, 90... 92, I think it was, after we made the playoffs one game short of a grand final and I you know, was talked about making a World Cup and didn't. That still grinds on me. And, um, and so some of those little individual goals. But in saying that too, when I finished relatively young because my body wasn't in, in really good shape, it makes you do other things and takes your life in, in other directions, which shows you there's more to life, as you're probably learning now, than rugby league. Even though it's such an important part of our lives, it's not life itself. And... Um, I've had to do other things and have success in other areas. But, um, no, look, I'm proud that I played NRL and I'm proud of of the person and player I, I was, but I would have liked to have um, probably ticked a few more boxes, but it wasn't to be. Yeah. Um, so you, you finished playing at, at 26. Do you go straight into becoming a, a sports agent or do you have other avenues first? No, effectively, uh, a guy called Warren Craig, who was my, my business partner, um, Warren was managing Glenn McGrath and a couple of footy players at the time, Matty Guyer and a few others, and Warren had helped me out a little bit towards the end of my career and asked me to uh, come on board, and we, we set up Titan Management at uh, the end of 99. Um, so, yeah, that's when, when it happened. So it happened relatively? Yeah, straight after, yeah. So I finished at Parramatta. Oh, end of 98, so started 99, yeah, we we, um, we started setting up Titan Management and went from there. Yeah. You, you, you said... You played through that Super League war. Did that have any influence on you um, wanting to become a manager? <laughs> yeah, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Us, Wayne Beavis and co, I think they did pretty well. No, not really. Didn't really. I didn't really think about becoming a manager until Warren mentioned it to me. And I you know, I was a PE teacher by trade, which I'd never really used because we were full-time playing um, with the first sort of group coming through that with the Super League war. Um, and then I was media trained, so I didn't know whether I'd go back to that type of thing. And then, you know, coffee with Warren, and it went went that way. Um, so it wasn't something I'd ever really thought or knew much about. I never had an agent when I played myself. I always just did uh, my deals myself with my dad, to be honest. Yeah, so you went, oh, you didn't see a gap in the market and think like, oh, I could do this better, um, you know, through your lived experience. Or like what was behind, like, you know, I've been for – Many a meetings with people, but I've not come out of it and thought, I'm going to start a sports management company. No, no, well, he was keen. And, and it did make me think there's a gap in the market. And I actually had a few players at Parramatta, younger players, like Jason Kalis and that who were who I'd met at, at Physio, believe it or not. He was a kid with heaps of injuries. And, and they'd asked me to look at things. And I'd, I'd actually sort of helped a few players behind the scenes. I was the players' rep with the union. Back then it was the MEAA, it wasn't the RLPA, Media Entertainment Arts Alliance. And I was always a players' rep and I was always an advocate for players. And it sort of just evolved from there. I think when I got asked, I thought I could make a difference. And, um, yeah, there probably was a little bit of a gap in the market. I don't think there was any former players really in that space. And I think um, I think that's really helped me in the last 22, 23 years, being able to relate to what players are going through because you've been there yourself. And I think players sometimes get a bit of comfort out of that. And, um, well, this bloke's telling me stuff, but he has lived it as well. Yeah, because 
you know, it's not all you know, signing glitzy contracts. There's there's a tough element oh, yeah. to the job, which, you know, we're, we're, we're going to come on to later. But did you have any idea what you were getting yourself in for? Oh, no. <laughs> not at all. And it's a 24-7 job. It is, and it's worry because it's people's lives, mate. You can't just leave it. There's there's guys that, as you get to the end of the season, I get really stressed, my wife and family notice, because someone someone doesn't have a job and it's nearly the end of October and they don't get paid anymore. That's that's stressful because you carry that burden. You know, other times there's some great joy when people get fantastic deals or achieve milestones. And, you know, I think the public only see the high side of all these NRL players. They're rich and they're famous and it's... The reality is not like that. The minimum wage is only eighty grand. That's not a lot if you've got married with three kids. No, I, I guess that that sort of leads me into the next question: is it seems that sports managers, in particular, have a a bad reputation publicly, and it's almost as if some people think that there's no need for you. Um, how do you feel about like the general opinion from the public uh, of sports agents? Oh, look, I understand it to a point because people don't really know what we do and they don't really know the ins and outs of the industry. And I also understand that there's been times probably historically where some people have behaved in a way that hasn't given the profession the best reputation um, in terms of maybe being more worried about commission than their player. Um, And I think it's also the same. Anything that's commission-based, people sometimes struggle to see value because you're paying later on, whereas... They don't see if they break it down, the value is that, well, okay, you know, you might have got $120,000 and you're playing your agent 7% and then he gets you $180,000. You've got an extra 60000 Yeah, you, you might be paying him a, a small whack of that, you know, 13, 14 grand, whatever, but you're still 50 or 60 in front and you get hopefully good service and exposure and sponsorships and endorsements and support and welfare and, and those sort of things if they're done properly. I but guess it is hard. I guess one one of the arguments would be, well, teams have still got to fill the cap. If player agents didn't didn't exist, do you think there'd be a greater disparity in pay, or it'd be more more people would be near near the mean, the average? How, how do you think it'd pan out if it wasn't for the sports agent? I know personally speaking from my own experience that I, I definitely well, I feel I needed someone to represent me. Because I didn't feel comfortable, I guess, what you may call, like, negotiating. Mate, it's very hard to see yourself. Even even for myself, I don't know if, if I'd want to go and put my own figures on myself. Because, you know, there's, there's always a bit... And rugby league's a working-class game. And if you're a proud working-class man, too, you don't want to go in and say, I'm worth a million dollars. You're more likely... If they say to you, oh, we think you're worth 250 oh, really? Is that what you think? And... It, it, it does put players in an awkward position, and I know a lot of players don't feel comfortable. That's why they get an agent. They don't. They they want someone to advocate for them. They want someone. But the other thing is, well, yeah. especially especially even like staying at a club where you where you have great relationships with the people that are gonna you know broker the deal. Like I wouldn't feel comfortable going in and speaking to my, my coach or my CEO, even if I know them really well about you know what my monetary value and length of contract would be and well mate only look even from ours and it stands that was one of the funniest meetings i've ever had we had a meeting with des hasler that went a bit south about your value i don't reckon you would have stood up and thrown a pen on the table <laughs> <laughs> no that was a <laughs> that was a good day mm. but you know but what i mean I, I then i got asked politely to leave the room <laughs> no so i was asked if i could just leave yeah. Someone asked if I could exit the room, and but what you didn't realise is I could see through the glass, like, <laughs> but I couldn't hear what was happening. But I could see the back and forth yeah. between you, Des, and Raylene, and there was, it was quite animated. Being, yeah, it, it was, was very animated, mate. It was, um, but at least you knew I had your back, and that's that. To be honest, that's what I hope all my players over the years know that that the best intention is for them. Um, it's not about me, and it's not. And, and look, see. They're, I've been well paid over the years for different things that I've done and for some of the players I've represented, but I like to think that they've got a good crack out of that and that they appreciate that. And I'm still really good friends with, with those sort of guys post-footy, post like guys like Gal who I've been involved with for 22 years, you know, from the start. So, you know, and people like yourself where I've seen you grow from a young bloke to, you know, married children and all. That's great, mate. And, and I, I cherish those relationships and, 
and I've enjoyed my job. But yeah, it is one of those jobs at times it is quite difficult and, and the public perception is frustrating. It can be for our oh, bloody six, Mr. Six, Mr. Seven percenters, Mr. Eight percenters, you know, they're just trying to take money. They take money out of the game and don't put anything into the game. And that hurts me because I am a rugby league person. I played the game my whole life. I've coached the game. I still coach the game. I've coached every year since I didn't play at kids teams. I'm still a junior chairman of my local junior club that I, as a volunteer that I grew up with. So... I love the game and I would never do anything to hurt the game, but I've also seen, you know, the tough side. I think there's a bit of a saying, you know, they say great game, shit industry at times, pardon the French, but and that's what it can be. It can be very difficult. And the game can spit people out. It can spit people out and hopefully we're trying to protect players from that perspective. Well, I guess one of the one of the major eggs from the fans would be, you know, when a player's still under contract or they've got a year in their favour and you know, they're looking to be moved for an increase in pay, which, you know, it's easy to point the finger at you and go, oh, it's the agent. You know, obviously there's another club involved as well that would approach you and say, you know that player that you look after? We're willing to pay him a lot more money. Can you get him out of his deal? 100%. It happens all the time. Well, you're the, I guess... You're, if, the, if, you're the middle person, right? Well, that's right. If the clubs aren't willing to move or don't want to do business, there's no business to be done. So the clubs have the choice. They don't have to move a player. Players contracted to, to whatever. And, and the rules are the rules at the moment. We can only play with the rules we're governed. If they change, bring in, um, you know, trade windows or all sorts of stuff, well, obviously that's what we do. But at the moment, it's a f- complete free market from the year. When you're off contract the year before, you can you can uh, look elsewhere. And clubs will do that anyway. They, See, clubs quite often will move players on that have still got one, two, three years to go or, or say, well, we give you permission to go and look. In other words, we'd like you to move. Yeah. <laughs> or we're not going to play. You know, there's, th- yeah, there's both sides to this, isn't there? There's the player that wants to move for a perceived better opportunity financially and they sort of get slated. But then you've also got the other side of where a club appears to have overpaid for a player and then wants to move them on. And you know are willing to you know, pay yeah. like you know pay fifty percent, seventy five percent, twenty five percent of the wage for for the, for the year. So it it does work both ways. Hundred percent, and that's why players need representation because in that situation the club is going to move them on. Or, or even worse, if you stay, you're not going to play first team. Like those conversations, and, and then your happen. value drops dramatically. Yeah, yeah I've, I've mate, I've got one on the go now that I'm waiting for a phone call that. Probably come out tomorrow. There'll be a player leaving a high-profile club to go to another club in the state within the next hour, and he's got two years to go on his contract. That's just how it happens. But if I, we don't bring that up unless they do, yeah. So it, it, it does work both ways. But I guess that the, you only get criticised when it's the player looking for you know a, a better opportunity. And I get that too because fans, fans are fans. They're not worried about the money or the profession. They just want to win and they want they want to relate to their team and their players. And if one of their good players or who they someone they relate to is then getting shopped around or moved on, fans get passionate. So, you know what, I, I understand that. I can, yeah. I can live with that and that's just, just the way it is. And you don't want to lose the passion of those fans. They're what makes no. the game great. It, they, they do, Matt, and they, they have a, a right to voice their opinion. And at the mm. end of the day, there's, they're heroes. Like... Mm. They, they hero worship some of the players in the NRL, sure. and you've got to love that. Um, one of the things you just briefly mentioned there is the way things operate now, and that you know the November the first deadline, and then it becomes you know you're a free agent. We often see players sign with a club in tw- well, well eleven and a half months time, but yet they play and remain at the club um, or their the, the current club for, for the remainder of the season, knowing full well. They're going to be moving on at the end of the season to play a full season under a, a, cl- a club's banner. Do you? I don't like it. You don't like the, you don't like the current system, or you don't like this. I, I don't like change? that bit. I don't like the bit that someone has got hasn't even started the season yet, and then they, there's nowhere they're going the following season. But I've done it. I did it with Jai Arrow when he left the Gold Coast, and and but but the difficult thing is, you know, Jai Arrow got a life changing deal without going into the, the intricacies of the deal. He got a life-changing deal. He was keen to come to Sydney for personal reasons and different things, and the deal worked out fantastic for Jai and for the club. But the time, because of the value of the deal, he was a high-profile player, played for Australia, playing 
Origin, etc. For them to fit the salary cap, the deal needed they needed to know where that deal was going to happen, or they got to go for the next player, or spend that money on an equal caliber player. And there's not that many caliber players off contract every year who can fill those holes. So it's a real tough one. But but the Gold Coast were comfortable knowing that the quality of person and the athlete and the and the competitor, the joy is that he was never not going to, you know, he was he was going to dig in for that year. But, mate, it's really awkward. It is really awkward. No one likes it, I don't think. But do you that's think, the system we're dealt with at the moment. Do you, think we can ha- do you think we can have a salary cap sport or a tightly run salary cap sport for the most part and have it done differently? We're the only real professional sport in the world that has a salary cap without a draft, which is quite interesting. Yeah. And I actually have always been thought that, a, especially a draft at junior levels... And, and entry levels into the game, rookie levels would be fantastic. I think it also helps those clubs that seem to be stuck in a bit of a rut. You know, their fans get a bit of joy knowing that, hey, some of the elite up-and-comers get drafted to us first. I think it's a good system. But again, you know, a draft is a restrainer trade, so people have to accept it. Other codes don't fight it. They know it's a restrainer trade, but it's an acceptable restrainer trade. Unfortunately, rugby league, that draft was went to court many, many years ago and it's left us in a weird situation when we got a tightly policed salary cap but no draft to to sort of add up, balance the um, equalisation of talent. So Cause, it's cause, an interesting one. Because technically now, like, players don't transfer. They go on what would be called in European football a Bosman. So Bosman was a, a footballer that when your contract ended, you, in previous years you still had to pay a transfer fee but then th- they changed the rules because of... Uh, Mark Bosman, Bo- Mark Bos- Bosnan, his name was, um, but that's an interesting one for employment law. But so we, they, they talk about a trade window happening or, or moving that date from November the first. But my biggest gripe with that is deals still get done anyway. Like you, without breaching any confidentiality, when it when the date was different, was it July the first or yeah, July thirty? Yeah, oh, June thirty. June July thirty, one. and and then then you became a free agent. Like you'd know that if you're a big. So let's take Jaya, Jaya for example. Um, let's say that date was June thirty, not November the first, and South had to, you know, rejig or, or were looking at their cap for the following season. You'd probably have that deal taken care of. Wait till June thirty. Everybody would know, and then on July the first, announce the deal, right? That yeah, that, I'd probably that, I'd probably wait a week, but um. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. But, <laughs> no, but it'd be, the, it'd honestly, be one of the worst kept secrets yeah, in rugby league. Everyone yeah. would know. He'd tell friends. Can I yeah. actually tell you the November one date to agents means nothing? It's actually it's a big thing for the media because they can write stories about off contract players. Agents and clubs aren't bothered. We're in discussions twelve year, twelve months of the year, right? Continually, so. You're talking about players coming off whenever. The deals aren't really done before then, but you have a rough idea who's interested, who's not. You know, I've got Matt Burton off contract. I've known who's interested in him for months. Yeah. You know so so I mean? technically, the clubs are acting... No, they're allowed like, to speak. They're just not allowed to, put, they're not allowed to put forward a financial offer. So, all right, let's... Let, if I'm... Say I'm, you know, whichever team, not the Bulldogs... I can call you before I can call you in October and say, Benton's off or he's av- he's available in Yeah, in November months. one. Yeah, in, we'd in be interested. N- we'd be interested. Yeah. We can't We can't make an offer, but we're definitely interested. And they do it all the time. And would you say And they'd well, say we'll, what sort of ballparks but yeah, yeah. Oh well, they be, talk ballpark. Might yeah. be a million a year, a year in year out, that's good. We'll see what happens. That's cool. You know, I've had heaps of people ring me up and go, Is James Graham available? Can we give him eighty minimum wage and stuff like that? <laughs> Don't tempt me, Dave. <laughs> Don't tempt me. No, you you'd come back all right. Uh, um, yeah, like is there a is there a silver bullet for this for this issue that is, you know, not it's not a blight on the game, but it's I, I, I get that it's that's the main uh, stakeholder that suffers during this that they've got to cheer on a guy that they know is is moving on. Like, mate, I'd like a trade window at some stage, even a couple. Um, I'd even like one like mid-year, like April, where players who are actually under contract can, a bit like the draft with the AFL, they can put themselves on the market with the club. The club would have to agree. You know, so clubs could see who you almost do some trades. The clubs 
could do some trades with each other mid year, only for a period. You, you know what I mean? And um, and then that might be better for Club X gets rid of that player and the other club picks him up and they give him one of theirs or put one of their on. I I think that and I'd also like it to be early. I don't like I really don't like what's coming to the game about players from teams that can't make the semi finals transferring that late to teams. Oh the, the loan system. I think that's I been abused after COVID. I don't like that. I it's been abused after COVID. It was never it never existed. It happened in COVID because of the, the bubble situation and I think it kind of got forgotten about. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was like Hang on, he's going where with what three games left of the season? Yeah. It, it, that that I agree. Like so, teams would purposely save a little bit of cap space and basically pay a you know a, a, say say for example a, a million dollar a year player well, the, the paying for like you know basically two months of service. The Philoma went to yeah Melbourne late, and now he's gone back to Tigers. That wouldn't sit well with Tigers fans when you know they're getting some beatings at the end of the year. One of their best players or longer-serving players has gone to another club and then he plays finals with that club. I think it affects the integrity of the competition too because part of winning the comp and is monitoring your roster, your list management and a bit of luck with injury and survival and, and the, uh, you know, you've really... That, that toughness of, of going through a whole season and, and, you know, someone gets busted, it's the next man up and, and it's your roster and, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I like the loan... The loan idea for, say, for example, a guy like Harry Grant. Fantastic. Like, he goes on a year-long loan to the West Tigers because he's stuck behind Cameron Smith. He's buying his time. He gets first-team experience. Like, you know, oh, he, like he, play, he plays Origin that year. If if he, if he the loan system doesn't exist for him in that example for a season-long loan, then you know, he doesn't play State of Origin that year. And yeah, he was arguably the best hooker in the competition that year as well. Fair play. So, you know, I... Maybe if Cameron Smith had got injured, whether Melbourne could have called him back, I, I don't know. But that's what happens in, in the Super League. There's dual registration, but there's also, you know, when I was coming through, there was lads on the fringe of the first team that were too good to be playing in the reserves, but not quite, or, or behind a, a really experienced quality player. But they'd like, they, well, the club didn't want to lose the youngster, so they'd loan them out to, you know, another Super League team. Mm and happily have them play against, you know, play against their parent club. So I think there's a there's a way we can get the loan system in, but I just don't like, I agree with you, I don't like how it gets abused at that the back end of the season. season. It needs it just, to be done earlier. Yeah. And, and such a short-term thing as well. It's yep. it, it, it's it's not on. And, and I can see why the bottom teams have done it, because they save money. Yep. Then they can prepay players. So what, what, what the Tigers didn't have to pay David was then would have been brought forward. They would have paid us, prepaid other players and keep more cap for 2023. So it makes sense that they're getting a benefit out of it. It's just not a good look for the game. And it's not... Yeah. I don't blame David or his manager or anything. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I do the same thing. I get... That's, yeah, you, the that's ru- you're in. playing by the rules. Yeah, but I just don't like the rules. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. You, you spoke Matt, about um, November 1st being used by the media. In a contract negotiation with a big name player how much of a part does the media play in that and do you ever use i guess contacts within the media to like leak a story mate can i um no i don't and then the, i get i think a few of the big journals get frustrated with me because it's not really i've never it's got it gets up my craw a little bit that um they want to know they'll ring up and go what's happening with player X's contract, I'm like, well, it's not really your business and I don't need to play that out. And I've always believed that you're talking to the club and, and you know if you know what your player's worth in the market, you don't really need to increase. And the, and the clubs that know what they're doing, they don't need the media to tell them how much Johnny is or what his value is or whatever. So, no, I, I try to keep... The, the, if anything, I find the media get in the way of the negotiation sometimes. And if they take educated guesses and get them right... It makes me look bad because I've told a club, look, we haven't made a decision yet, and they're going, oh, he's staying or he's going here, and then he ends up doing that. They think that I've been full of BS the whole time, which isn't true. So I, I actually wish the media would just leave it alone and let us get the deals done and, and do what we need to do. But I also get the public interest and they're just doing their job. So while they frustrate me that way, the media, they probably get frustrated that I don't give them as much as some other people do. And some people find that that's a way they can increase value for their client or play 
Club A or Club B off against each other. I don't really think... I think the clubs are probably smarter than that, to be honest. Do you, do you ever have that where you've got into a negotiation and um, like a CEO or a coach or head of football has gone, what, what was all this spot in the paper? And you've just gone... Yep. I don't know. I've even had it the other way where I've walked out of meetings and a journo's rang me and then given me word for word what the meeting was. And I'm thinking, there's only four of us in there and I didn't say a word. So what's going on here? But yeah, it's just rugby league leaks. Rugby league leaks everywhere. So it's hard to keep a secret. It's hard to do things. That's why probably one of my favourite deals ever was the Carmichael Hunt one when he went to AFL because the media didn't, the media didn't get it. You know, they had him going to every club, every rugby union club. You know, he was going everywhere, but no one saw him going to play AFL, so that was pretty cool. Keep your powder dry on that, Dave. That's yeah. that, that's coming up. That was good. Yeah. D so, so for you, that you don't really y use the media to to get your clients maybe aware that the to be looking to leave. Would, would oh, you ever no, do that? I, I like don't really need. I don't think I use the media for um, much for for client movement. I don't really think you need to. Probably more appreciate the media more with younger players if you're trying to to um to get some exposure which is good for their profile which lifts you know their awareness um sometimes in terms of reputation management you need the media to help restore and repair some some um things that may have happened for a player especially if a player's had had a few things go wrong off the field and and they're pretty poorly looked at in the public domain well the media is one way you can help repair that image and maybe show the real a different side to that player than people might perceive. Um, the media is a huge part of the game and the media exposure is what fans eat up and love and if we don't have them, there's no game and, and that all adds to the value of the game, to people through um, coming through the gates, to corporate sponsorship, to the money in the game, to the player's salary. So you need the media and you need oh, to work with them. Yeah, But, uh, but there's just a fine line. I try and maintain that professional silence at different times, but yeah, it is hard. There has been times when... Yeah, you do, do need to speak to them and need to get a, a, an opinion out there. Have you ever read a headline and just gone, that's just complete a thousand BS? Times. And r have you ever rang the journalist up and said, what, like, what are you doing? You're way off. I used to. I used to, but I don't, to be honest with you, I don't read the papers that much anymore. I follow a little bit through social media and a little bit and Fox News and different things, what's on the rugby league, sort of what they're talking about, so I know what's going on. Is that 360 show? That's pretty good. I watch that every now and then on Fox. Really good, intelligent voices on that one. Yeah, um, the, but the, only the best on. Yeah. 360. All jokes aside, though, I um, yeah, I, I it's follow not a, a joke. Bit. <laughs> 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 no, no, it's not. But I, I don't, I don't get upset anymore. Yeah. I've learned to just go. You know what? It is what it is. If someone's got it real wrong, I'm more likely to say, "Hey, mate, why didn't you check?" You know, he didn't. And I, I get more annoyed if it affects me. Like I've, I remember when Matt Pryor went to. Um, leads and someone broke the story that he signed and we weren't even there and i'm still trying to get money out of gary hetherington which is like trying to get blood out of a stone and they're saying he's gone and i hadn't even finalized it with granola and it was just like i'm going this guy's right or gonna be right but i'm two or three days off that and it actually really stuffed me up that it was released so i rang this journal and go man what are you doing oh i know he's signed he's he hasn't so I was like, like, I'll let a few expletives go. He hasn't signed because I'm the one doing it. I'm telling you. But I guess for a, a situation like that with a guy moving overseas, like, he'd probably want to tell some friends and family first. That, he hadn't told his parents. Hadn't yeah. Like, it's just and like, they're finding out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's... That's when you get a bit angry. Yeah. And you've got to go. Because that, that's, a, that's a big move for someone yeah. to move halfway around the world. But it's a big move. The deal could have fallen over because of the bloke breaking the story that hadn't happened yet, if you know what ah, I mean. Ah, right. Okay, yeah. So it was like, and I'm still trying to get money out of Cronulla to get a payout to help pay him and because and, they needed his cap spot. Similar story. You know, he just won a comp. He was an older player. He was on good money. He played Origin. And it was just one of those ones. It was a little bit difficult. And then the media got in the middle of it and went, oh, yuck. So, again, this is probably more for one of the... the the higher grade players, a typical negotiation, you know, is it the old, we we know where we're going to land, they'll undercut, you'll overcut, <laughs> back and forth, and then, hey, we get there. Depends who you're dealing with. 
I've so got, each, each club's... And each club's different. And sometimes you've got relationships with guys you've dealt with for many... I've got guys now, some clubs I've dealt with for many, many years. We sort of cut to the chase pretty quickly. Yeah. And other times, you know, there's times they know that I've got the player they need and they're going to have to pay more than they want to. And I sometimes know that I really need this player to have a job and I'm going to have to take less than, than I want. So, and they get to pay what they want. So, you know, you win some, you lose some on that, on that regard. Um, yeah, the old... I'll ask for f- 600 to get 500 and I'll offer 400 mm. to meet us in the middle, yeah. That does still that, happens that, a little bit, yeah. but it's annoying sometimes. And then sometimes you can go through weeks, months of negotiations and you go back to your first offer and you end up there anyway and it's like, could have saved ourselves. And sometimes you just, you know, mate, there's some really good deals that happen. Other times, you know, you're sitting there and not much is happening and suddenly two or three guy has a really good game and two or three clubs come in and then you just sit back and... Let them let them fight it out yeah. like a seagull over a chip, and then you just just sit back, and the dollars keep going up, and you're really not doing that much anyway. I'm undervaluing myself, but letting the letting the player do the work. Yeah, have right. you ever got have you ever gone into a negotiation with a figure in your head, and the club has offered like way more than what you thought, and you've just gone. <laughs> yep, and you're trying to keep your poker face. Yeah, <laughs> yep, and you sort of look at them and go, yeah. Well, yeah, I'll talk to him about that. That's probably in the ballpark. You sort of can't. You just want to run outside and yeah. get yes. on this now. Get over here. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it can be like that. There are some. There's been some exciting deals over time. So you just go, hey, this is good. Mm. Happy do, Christmas. Does it ever? Do they ever like write it on a piece of paper, fold it up, and like like just slide it across like you see in the movies? That has happened. Oh really? Yeah, it has happened. That's cool. Like. Having a beer and someone to ride on a coaster, <laughs> and then you go. I just keep I mean, the coaster. Slide it back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You try and let them go first. Yeah. Is, is that how you... I do. You always let them go first? I'd like to. Got to get an idea what they're thinking. And you sort of know how some people do it. You know, they're cap different people. You get different techniques. You know, the ones who go in... Some people just go straight for a deal. You know, okay, that's, that, they're not going to move much. Others will... You know, they're going to lowball you and you're going to have to go through the... Back and forth, and yeah, it's funny. It's good fun. It's good. good Is there sport. an? Uh, I guess there's an art to negotiation. Do you do you do any training or any reading on it, or you? Just I've read books and that over the years, and and I've followed different people, and I watched. You know, even when I first started, agents like Wayne Beavis and that had been around some of the deals they do and and different things, and I've, you know you watch different sports and and um, and how things are done. I've met people from different companies overseas and agents that have worked in in um, Union in the UK and, and Premier League and, and, and the NFL and those sort of guys I've met over the years. It's interesting. I think you never stop learning. Um, and businessmen, it's good to see. But there's some great businessmen in rugby league. Guys like Nick Politis, who, you know, they're, they're good businessmen, mate. You learn off people. I love sitting to listen to those sort of guys. They're, that's how you learn. So when you, you stop learning. So when you go into these negotiations, you're not just, you're not always talking figures you're actually talking ideas sometimes 100 yeah, yeah. and it's just you just hear about how different people do different things and i've obviously had other businesses over the years run pubs and different things and um so it's it's good to to look at at the scope of business and how business is done and the business of sport it's really interesting but i think you've got to keep an open mind and you never stop learning you always but in saying that i think it's um i, I do my research even if they don't realise, you've got to know your market. You've got to know what other clubs are paying. You've got to know what each position is worth. You've got to know what that club's cap should be there or thereabouts, what sort of money they may or may not have for that player. And then players have to make a decision. You know, if you're staying at your current club and they're a top four club, you're probably expected to take a little bit less than what your overall market could get you to one of the bottom four clubs because you're winning comps or you're competing for comps and you're comfortable where you are and you don't have to move. So there's different values you put on different things. So I think it's all about preparation. And it's also knowing that it's not just about money. It's knowing that could that player who moved from the country at 17 to Canberra really go and live in the middle of Sydney? Or could you know, a guy from Queensland who's grown up there, does he really want to move? Or when people are comfortable and happy in their lives, well, that's, you can't put a price on that either. Do you ever forecast the disaster? Um, you try and avoid it. Sometimes you move. You might jump early because you think there's a disaster. Could, could, could go that way. 
So that way you might try and move that player a year early so they don't have that year where they're sitting in reserve grade and, you know, their value then disappears and they're looking for someone to give them a, a last chance dance. Um, but sometimes you see it, even off field, sometimes you worry about players who have a certain personality and a risk-taking personality and that's what makes them such good footballers is the risk they take and you worry that, yeah... We're, we're could, could be on the let us could be on the front page rather than the back page, yeah. which is a bit scary. So, uh, have you ever advised a client not to take a deal and they've taken it? Hmm. I've probably at the end of the day, I'll put all the options there and let the player decide. I'll yeah, look. but there has been a couple where I've probably said, "Oh, mate, you might be better off staying where you are or not doing that." Or you might be better off moving, and then they didn't, and it didn't work out. Or but yeah, there's been a couple of them, but not, not that many that stand out. Not that many where I go, oh, that was, that was dire. We should have really gone the other way. Yeah. Um. Todd, Todd Carney was one when he went to, um, he nearly went to Penrith with Gus and all that, and then all the stuff happened at Cronulla, and I sort of think sometimes, well, maybe he should have taken that five year deal at Penrith. But who knows. You never know. Um, we're going to get on to some of the the big issues and some of the big personalities and players that you've managed over the years. Um, I'm going to start from the not a particularly good highlight the um, the Storm salary cap. Mm. Um, who did you? What players did you have during that time? I had Hoffy, Ryan Hoffman, and Matty Guyer. Yeah, to be honest, the Storm salary cap was made out to be the agents were Im implicated a lot worse than we actually knew. The Storm had a, in hindsight, when I read all about it, they had a brilliant system that none of us knew about. We all thought that things were set up and they had some, some you know, two lots of books and different things and, and um, some third-party stuff going on that, that actually is now legal. <laughs> but but oh. back then it's a part of the rules. So, so the third-party stuff was... Some of it was. Some of it was non-existent. They had some, I can't remember the exact thing, that some game day thing which they were paying players through, but we thought that was real. But it wasn't. It was a bit of a charade, facade. Um, but there's other stuff now that in terms of clubs can introduce third party, like sponsors, who's not a sponsor of their club or in completely independent. They can introduce them to, to agents and to players and then you try and negotiate terms. And that's what Melbourne had done with a few. That's what I had one with... Um, with Ryan, Ryan Hoffman and, and under the rules now it would have been fine, but rules back then they judged probably differently to what I thought. Yeah. Mm. Do, do you think enough is done in third party industry for our game stars? I think there could be, I think there's untapped potential. There's people who want to put money into the game if it could be done. Uh, I don't really think there's any club out there getting a huge advantage over any others by. I, um, I'm not saying the game is, is so much more regulated than that now. Probably post the Melbourne stuff, and then the Parramatta stuff, there was a bit of that. But I um, I think the game's really, it's almost over-regulated probably to a point where, you know, the, the cap stuff that you see now is that a club's miscalculated and paid someone, you know, to bring, you know, you're capping when parents come to games or you're capping this, you're capping that. Um, you know, it's almost like getting a speeding fine in a, you know, doing 65 in a 60 zone, there's, there's no... I don't think there's high-level um, breaches going on at all. I think it's pretty regulated and it's really evened itself out. Do you think there's money out there? Not that, again, it, it's not all about money, but do you think there's people wanting to put money into the players that can't because of the regulations? Uh, probably. Um, and just the way they probably don't know how from that perspective. And they want to support their club because, see, club sponsors or associated sponsors can't sponsor players unless it goes through. They can sponsor the club. Mm. But so if you got your major sponsor wanted to put in to help keep the star, of the, you know, if one of Tripp's, Matt Tripp's companies want to keep Cameron Munster there, they can't, he can't add to that, which you go, well, there's money in the game to do that, but then they will be perceived as an unfair advantage and all that sort of stuff. And I get it in, on one hand, but I do think there are, there is some dollars out there that, it could be tapped into for the game itself and, yeah. and for the stars of the game. Mm. Um, b back to the the Storm salary cap. Uh, when did you know? 
Oh, I've just went to break. So you're at home. I can't even remember. The too radio much on, TV on. You're like, yeah, there was stuff and um, cause there was a lot of anomalies there with the NRL that had signed off on because there was players taking variations and that I saw and, and that had all been signed off by Ian Schubert and the salary cap people and that and then then they were yeah there was a, there was a, it was pretty intricate in the end but no it just sort of broke really suddenly and then it was uh, a bit of a blur to be honest but I wasn't hugely uh, you know Matty Guy had they they alleged something against him but that was cleared um, and then Hoffy had a third party which they said should was was promised but wasn't pre-approved was pre it needed to be after the contract rather than before the contract uh. it was some technicality like that so to be honest mate I wasn't really really that bothered um, did you get a six month ban for that though? I think we had a three month ban three month ban um, and, and to be honest I think we got banned from October to December it might have been six months it was the off season there wasn't much business done so it wasn't too onerous but it wasn't no it's not nice it's not, yeah. not, not a great thing and it's not something I'm particularly look I actually don't think I, <laughs> I, I was in breach so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with myself and uh, I don't go oh geez I did the wrong thing I'm, I don't feel bad at all in the in, in hindsight I should have just not bothered fighting it and just going yeah chuck a ban at me because I thought it was handled it looked like the NRL at the time was trying to um because they'd missed so many things in their governance that the because they didn't have an integrity in it then, it was just a salary cap order and that. He'd missed so much, many things, and I think that they were just trying to cover their own backside. So, Do you think the agents got an unfair blame for that? Like, I mean, I'm, talk, I'm not oh, just talking you, but I mean, talking in general. It was yeah, like, probably. The, it's the greedy agents. Yeah, yeah. Again, to be honest, the agents don't really get the benefit. The agents weren't benefiting. benefiting they usually from, got a slight benefit from. Well, if your player gets more money from that perspective, but. But you could have just said to the club, well, just pay me all this, bang, straight through the cap or whatever. And, you know, the club was getting the benefit because they were obviously in some ways having a higher cap than other clubs because they were paying through through different means. And, you know, I don't even know whether it's true or not. You hear about the boat and this and that. And, you know, you'd, you'd wonder that if that's turning up in your driveway that you didn't know. But, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> But I, I think, yeah, look, mate, it is what it is. I thought the club, to take premierships and that off, and I also thought that the players they were trying to keep, Melbourne, they didn't use any cap to entice the superstar from another club. They were all homegrown. They are all their own players. I thought they got... I thought they actually got... I still think they won those comps, so I'm... <laughs> I don't know what other people think, other clubs think, other players think. For me, I thought Melbourne got... It was overly harsh to... To a race history, um, but I guess they still those guys still turned up on that day and did the business on that day, and that's what it is. Well, you know, you played against one of them, didn't you? When you in no, one no, when, did you, when did you play the Storm in a twelve? Was that after the Cubs? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that from a like from a player's perspective, I don't know. Probably like I, I don't know the ins and outs of it. It depends on the extent of yeah. the the extra cap. That they were playing with, because I guess it's, I know what you're saying in terms of, yeah, they they still went up there, did the business, they were all homegrown, it wasn't enticement, but they probably couldn't have kept. Them yeah, all couldn't together. have kept them. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's. Or, or true. some of those lucrative offers from other teams. You know. Yep, they didn't bother. Yeah, but that's if you're also assuming. And this might open a can of worms that every other team in the comp was completely compliant, cap compliant those years. Dave Riolo, you said it, not me. You know, did the team coming last breach the cap? No one cared. Who knows? Mm. Cryptic. <laughs> I write a book one day. I'll let you know. <laughs> um, you you spoke about him um, briefly before about um, the deal that never happened to Penrith, uh, Dally M. Medal winner. Yeah. Um, he gave that to you, didn't he, Todd Carney? I think I've seen it in your office. Yeah, it's a replica. He got oh. two things. Yeah. He's oh. a, he's a well. It's, it's, it is a nice. It's a it's a nice gesture. Like hundred percent. I've known Todd since he was fifteen, and he's still one of the best young players and men I've ever been involved with. He's just a solid person. Some of the stuff that used to get written about him, I used to take really personally because I knew and know what a good person he is, and 
and really, if you look, if you Google Todd and look at the incidents he'd had, he never hurt anyone but himself. In 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 most instances, I think he had a couple of um, he had a DUI or something, which obviously is you know that's that's not condoned, and we we know people and do that, and that can have yeah. horrific effects. But but most of the stuff that Todd got breached for were things that you know silly things on the drink or, or whatever, and I'm not condoning that, but. He, I think he got an unfair uh, whack, Todd, at different times. I've had him in my home when I, when uh, my kids were younger. You know, Todd would just come over and play with the kids. He'd come for dinner and he'd, you know, he'd take his plate and what. Just little things that you know the guy's been really well brought up from a lovely family. Lost his dad young, which really, really hurt him. Um, and made it was, you know, I saw the change in him and the hurt and. You know, if you've seen Todd, he's got ink all over him. He reckons if his dad was still alive, he wouldn't have a tattoo, so I don't know. But he's, yeah, he's a cracking bloke, Todd. He's a good person. His heart's in the right place and always has been. And, uh, yeah, he's, we've had, <laughs> again, I should write a book because there's been some stories I can't, can't tell. But, but um, yeah, he's, uh, he's, he was an interesting client to represent Todd. There were some times, I think he's caused a few of these greys and, uh but he also um, put plenty of smiles on people's faces. He was, and he's a good company. He's a care, he's a caring guy. You only got to see those guys. He's still good friends with, like Boyd Cordner and Mitch Pearce and those guys. They've, they've stayed solid all that group for years and years and years. And Wade Graham and and um, they all support each other. And and yeah, Todd's a cracking guy. But yeah, he uh, he lived a, an interesting career, <laughs> an interesting life. He has. When something negative is has happened how does that process work from a, a player manager perspective let take the the bubbler incident for argument's sake how how does that work from from your end well i got sent the photo the night before it broke someone said this is coming from the, um, the club and um i was actually down the snow with my family we were skiing had a few days off and my phone beeped, it was about 9.30 at night. And, um, and I wasn't going to look. I looked at it and I went, oh, my wife went, oh, what's wrong? I went, I'm not skiing tomorrow. <laughs> she had a picture on my phone. And um, and then I woke up in the morning. I thought, well, who knows? I don't know where it's out there because someone's obviously taken it. Where they're just, And then you're thinking a hundred things. Is it a blackmail thing? Does someone want money? Has it been released? Has it gone public? Is it this and that? Were you... And then I remember the time was ticking over and I'm thinking, 7.30, nothing, 8 o'clock, nothing, 8.30. We've had brekkie and it's half getting ready to ski and thinking we're going to have a day out. And and then about quarter to nine, I remember clearly and it just went... And I've got missed calls from every... I was getting missed calls from Darwin, from Western Australia, like non, non-rugby non league. I think I, think I would have had a over 150 calls from media outlets across the whole country and then trying at the same time to deal with Cronulla and because they were just going to sack him without a hearing with this and that. In the end, they did. They actually followed the wrong process and we, we took them for, for that and Todd won because um, they didn't follow due process, which no one cared at the time. All was saying, oh, look at this photo. It's disgusting. But when you look at the guys in the toilet, in a public toilet, you know, suppose it was someone he knew, and that got that was horrendous. That was, and you got the you got to deal with people don't realise they're quick to throw rocks now, but you got to deal with the fallout from his whole family. You, you know, James, that with yourself, the there's a people behind that no one else knows. Your mum, your dad, your cousins, your their best friends, their work friends, your 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 partner, and and their families. You know, Todd's sisters and. And um, and his mum and you know, you know and it's just the media and people don't care about it. They just go for the jugular. They, there's someone's in there's blood in the water and there's sharks, it, and it's hard. And for me, I just had to get a I just get a clear head. I just went away on my own and I just worked through what I needed to work through. Um, look for a positive statement, um, and then look. The best thing about Todd, with a couple of incidents, to be fair, Todd had a couple of incidents in his career, but he never lied to me. So I knew whatever he told me, no matter how big it was going to be, he told the truth. So I could back him knowing that there wasn't 
going to be more come out, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know, the bubble was one of those things. There probably couldn't be much more. But you don't know. Was there anything else happened that night? Did anything? And he'd tell you what, what's going on. So at least I knew what I was playing with. And, yeah, then it's, you know, it's um, it's just a process that you've got to go through. <laughs> it's and a draining it's hours and hours and hours and hours on phone and, and then putting to club about... The worst thing Cronulla did, which annoyed me, was that they... It was released on a press release that he was sacked before they'd told us. Oh, that, really? That really annoyed me the time but also oh, they didn't have the dialogue directly with you they've just well they were up. still saying they were looking at whatever but they put out a press release that he was it was something i can't remember the exact time frame that's why we went to went legal on it on the process i can't imagine that being good for a person's mental state to no 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 it wasn't good at the time and he was on a big contract for quite a few years to go and yeah, it was messy for everyone. Shane Flanagan was gutted. Obviously, he was the coach and different things. And it was, yeah, it was tough times. But I've had a few of them over the years with different things, with drug incidents, with all sorts of things. And you get, as horrible as it sounds, it's probably one of my strengths now as an agent is I, I do handle a crisis because I have. Crisis had management, to. yeah. Yeah, and you, um, the biggest thing you've just got to worry about is the person's well-being and remember that there are people and their families. And, and that's when, as I said, because the, the whole... And it's even worse now with social media because it can be out there like that and everywhere. Yeah. And uh, that makes it tough. Yeah, I, I bet. So a lot of support around Todd. Um, yeah. Like you immediately, you leave the snow and you, you're with him? No, he, well, he, um, we come home, yeah, and then he came to my place and um, just laid low. Poor bugger. But, um, and he had good family and that around him too. So he, I think he went back to Golden first and then he came to Wollongong and then... Yeah, keep going on, but got through it. You get through it. Do you think it was blown out of proportion that bubbler incident? Heaps. Yeah. Like of all, like like you say, he's only. Well, I'd, I'd like to say he. I'd say I, I think I use the analogy at the time when people take photos in the leaning tower of Pisa, they're not really holding up the um, tower, mate. I think it was a more a optical illusion. I don't really know. And the people are going, "Oh, did he really in his own mouth?" And I'm going, "No, I don't think he did, but." We never really went to that. <laughs> it was not really the important thing. The photo was just a crook photo of, and and you know, people have done dumb things, but drinking and carrying on. And I guess his audience wasn't the world, was it? It was just. Well, it was in the toilet. If yeah, he'd be, if he'd done that in a public place, and was doing it, and people took offence to that, yeah, and then complained, that's that to me is a lot different mm. than, you know, doing a bit of a fountain trick in the in the toilets it's not look is it pleasant no it's not but i think we've all probably seen worse especially right. you from england who knows what they do over there those li like the liverpool lunar day soccer hooligans evident fans wow <laughs> um another very big personality that you've managed uh paul gallon notorious throughout rugby league circles for being tight with his money you know what? Gal cops um, a bad rap there. Do you give him special rates? <laughs> yeah, always, of course. <laughs> Has to. But he's been around for a long time. He jokes, he's put my kids through school, he reckons. He probably has. <laughs> Thanks, Gal. He'll ask for, I better not say that, he'll ask for a refund. No, but Gal, you know what? Gal's not tight. Gal will always pay his own way. He won't He won't be the bloke who doesn't shout if there's, you know, there's six in a shout and number six goes missing. That's not Gal. He'll pay his own way. Will he pay any more? <laughs> Probably not, but but he'll um, he'll always pay his own way. And he's you know he's uh, he's an amazing man as an as an athlete. And his mindset is um, yeah is as good as I've seen as a in terms of when he wants to do something. He's a tough tough human, and, and uh, he's good value. He's got a bit of a. I think we've done well with Gal because really he was such a thug, and now everyone loves him, and that. He did all sorts of things. He ripped out people's stitches. Anthony LaFranchi was one of my clients, and Gal ripped his stitches out. He had a racial thing. He had a drug thing. He had stomped on someone. He did something else. He he chinned eight miles. He, <laughs> he was a he was horrible. No, he's great. How how was the like? Obviously, I've met him around the traps. Obviously, a, a very proud man. Um, when that um, the drug suspension hit, how how was that? For, for you and, and oh, him. that was tough. That was one of the toughest. Um, 
And tough on Gal because he became the face of it just yeah. because of who he was. And mm. you ask people now, I think there was 14 players. They couldn't probably tell you half of them. You know no. what I mean? And no, they'll you're say right. Paul Gallant. And he was actually, what annoyed Gal even more, he, was, he actually asked. He asked the doctor. And he went and said, is this above... Like, he did the right things. He followed the processes you told, and they still got stung for it. And he's going, well, how did I end up in this? I felt for him in there, and I saw the pain and the mental... Mate, there were some really tough, dark times for him um, because he sort of got labelled with it, and it wasn't his fault at all. And, uh, and you know, he's got a, he still cops things every now and then now, which are really annoying for me and for him and for his family and all that. But what do you do? You just get on with it. And um, He's making a really good name for himself in the media, and... Because he speaks his mind and he makes a bit of sense. And, you know, interesting to see his head, like yours, at the end of it. A bit rough, but he's <laughs> worked hard. Yeah. So, uh, again, wh- where, where were you when that hits and what's the, the oh, I'm straight up, mate. I was up there at Cronulla. I actually was in the room. I think I was one of the only agents there. And, there were, you know, blokes who went, my clients, well, what do we do here? And we're just trying to get legal advice, get the right advice, tell people to just say nothing. Let's get... All the facts, all the bits. Yeah, it was crisis time. And it was heavy, that. That was really heavy. Um, and not a pleasant time. I would three or four of those Cronulla guys at the time who were in that group. I think that, um, And then a few others who you know, obviously wanted a little bit of a hand too, just to talk through that. So, yeah, it was hard. Um, but you get through that and you realise that, you know, it's, it's not life. Yeah. And, it's, and that's when you've got to support players and work through that and realise, you know, they, they, there was a whole lot of things that the players, um, and you've been in those situations, players, and I did it when I played, you walked in, there's a cup of, on the drink that, take that um, protein, take this, take that powder, you know, when you assume that the people giving you that stuff have got your best interest and have, um, and, and have checked that it's, it's kosher and it's above board and it's regulated and allowed and legal, and yeah, so that was a really tough one. All around, there was a fair few mistakes made, but that's that happened, and you just got to get on with it. Well, human behaviour and conformity is something I've looked into, and a lot of people think that they act a certain way, but in the situation, it's far from it. No. Um, even to things like leaving a burning building, which is something I learned in psychology, um, you don't. You actually act as others act because people don't want to act alone. Yeah. Um, and you know, you see your teammate. Oh, well, they're getting it. Well, it must be fine. Or it's coming from a, you know, a person in a lab coat or in an f- official club colours. It's yeah, like, 100%. well, yeah. Well, it, 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 why would I even ask? Correct. And then people you outside, yeah, why wouldn't you ask? Why wouldn't you ask? So, well, what, why would I ask? Can, can I ask every time I go for a meal? Like, like what's what's in this? Like, you you just don't. You just you don't know. You just you you put trust in people, and you can't be that untrustworthy where you're asking. Every single protein shake, every single process, every thing, single thing that you do. Even things in the gym. I forget you're not putting something in your body, but what you're doing with your body in the gym, on the field, you're trusting that these people know the best way to prepare your body to play this game, yeah. to be the best player you can be, because they want to win a comp and they're from the club. and they've. So it is. It was, it was really You have your blow-ups every now and then, but w- w- what are we doing this for? Mm. You know, there's a reason. Right. Yeah, so that was tough. Yeah, I bet it was. But it was um, with his boxing career. Do you do? Oh, I've helped a little bit, but he's he's done his own, got his own people who've prepped the fights and done all that stuff. We did the first couple with him when he because they were charity ones and all that sort of stuff. But that as that evolved, mate, that wasn't my domain, not my area of expertise in terms of who he should be fighting, whatever. And he d- he just signed a couple of deals with no limit to just fight for them. They just agree on a price, and so that bit was pretty easy. You didn't need to nego- you didn't negotiate no, that. I did the first couple, but not not the the last few, no. But then just involved with the sponsorship and different things, and um, yeah, he's done he's done well out of it. He's done really. But he's, well. you know, his next fight will be his last. He'll fight Hodges, and that'll be it. And I admire his honesty as well. That he's like, I'm just a prize fighter. Hmm. He is, and he says now he says that I'm getting slower and I'm getting older, and I'm, it's, I need to finish this. So, you know. Look at his head, he should be finished too. He's covering too many knocks. Right. His nose needs a bit of work. It's probably all the sparring as well. Like, I can't imagine that being fun. I think he enjoyed it heaps. I don't think he enjoys it as much as he used to, and that's when you know. Mm. Actually, when I talk about retirement, I look at and, and guys like yourself and the Morris boys and Hodkinson and 
and um, Hoffman and, and Court, the big names, most retire from training, try from pre-season. Mm. Still love the game, but just don't... Um, the the, the work, process to get... The process yeah, to get... To get in the building, to yeah. get on the pitch. It's tough. Gets, like, I, I thought that when I was retiring, and people... Well, I'm still willing to work hard in life, but I just don't... I, I, that process of yeah. being there... Put and, your body through a lot, mate. And also then... You're not quite capable of what you used to be able to, what you used to be capable of, and it's a bit like, well, yeah. And you start getting. I remember even the end. I, when I was so tired at 26, but I remember I was really fast when I first started. So I needed to be bringing the ball back and had a few injuries, and then, and then you get tackled, and you think, how'd that bloke catch me? He wouldn't have caught me. Yeah. Two years ago. And, uh, no one yeah. ever caught me. Um, we spoke about one of the your favourite deals to do, Carmichael Hunt. Nobody's seen it coming the AFL, um, how do those cross-code deals transpire? Mate, that was bizarre. It just um, sort of evolved and I'd met a couple of people and then the guy rang me and I, and I said, are you fed income? Yeah, and then we, he went and we organised a couple. Of, he went and had a kick with some, had a kick with Nathan Buckley down in, in Melbourne and, and then also met, Believe it or not, there was an Origin game, State of Origin game at um, Marvel Stadium down Docklands there, which was the AFL house is on, is is part of that the AFL head office, and you know I went in it before the game and had a meeting with the AFL at the at the Rugby League State of Origin about them coming on board to to sign Carmichael Hunt as a marquee signing, and it was just it was yeah it was bizarre. Um, the AFL at the time was, I thought they were advanced on rugby league in terms of the way they interacted and the professionalism and the, yeah, the systems they had in place. They were really impressive to well, deal what, with. What systems? Like, what do you mean by just that? Just everything. They were across game. They, they just seemed more organised. They seemed ahead of the game. They... They were more professional in the way they dealt with. Do you think the fact that it never got leaked speaks enough volumes? Oh, 100 percent. I can't believe that. And because yeah, if that's NRL, you imagine it gets leaked, right? But it's probably vice, that day. But yeah, Mate, I'm talking six months of stuff wow. going on, and no one knew a thing. And I'm and people like that Peter Bedell because he follows that in Queen. He was ringing me weekly. Oh, is Carmichael doing this? Is Carmichael doing that? Oh, whatever you whatever you reckon, Pete. You just keep writing it, mate. It's all good. And he like he was fine. He wasn't he didn't have a blur or anything, he was good. But um yeah, then in the end it uh it was good fun. And it was a journey for him. He amazing athlete to be able to do what he did and, and he went and played in between. Once we did the AFL deal, he had a six month window, he went and played for Biarritz in France, played rugby union. So he just was that sort of guy. How'd you um How'd your French go? How'd you deal with the the Frenchies? Oh, no, that was, it Blake's a good speak English, so it was all right. Was he a chance of staying in league? Like, what got him over the what what got him over the line to the AFL? Like, you as a as a sports agent, as someone that's representing him, you know, what, was there a conversation around? Maybe you should stay in league. You've got a good oh, thing yeah. happening here. Like, what? You know, you talk about the AFL's professionalism, but it's a huge like sport. The sports in terms of like the skill range or the or the. Believe it know. or not, I think it was the challenge, the, the cha athletic the, challenge. It was the athletic challenge. So people challenge. think it was money. It wasn't money. I'll tell you that Carmichael was motivated that way. He was motivated, a bit like when Michael Jordan went and tried to play baseball, or went and played baseball, not tried to played baseball. He wasn't as good at baseball as he was. At basketball. And Carmichael wasn't as good across the game. Like, he was good enough to play AFL at a professional level. But in rugby league, he was in the an elite class. He was that top 10% sort of thing. He, never, he didn't reach those heights in AFL. But he showed he could compete at that level and coming through with a limited amount. So it was a challenge of, of an athlete. And to play triple codes at that level, I think, he, he was more about that for him. He'd done a lot in rugby league from a young, young age. You know, he'd been one of the youngest origin players. You know, chose to play for Australia rather than New Zealand. We had that decision to make at 17 years old and um, and, and came through the Queensland. Origin system was one of the youngest Bronco. His first year out of school, he played every NRL game for the Broncos. He'd won comps. 
He played Origins. He'd won series. He played for Australia. So I think he ticked a lot of boxes. And it was like, hey, he was one of those elite, elite athletes that the challenge was was really enticing to him. Obviously, then I wanted to make the commercial reality fantastic for him. But the commercial reality was... The commercial aspect of the deal was irrelevant if he didn't want to do the challenge. Once he decided he wanted the challenge, Duck then obviously I on. worked as hard as I could to make it a cracking deal, and it was. But um, if he didn't want to do it, it wouldn't have even got past yeah. first base. Thanks, but no thanks. Do you think he regretted it at all? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think he's that type of guy. He's a really positive. Mm. He's done a master's in psychology, and he's coaching up there. And I really like listening to him. His, yeah. his mo- I, I think we interviewed him for Triple M. I really like you should get him on hearing your podcast. what he um, what he what he had to say. Well, mate, you could li- tip I'll, us in. I'll do that. Yeah. He'd be good. No, he's I, te- I, and he's, he's an intelligent mate. man, and he's a cracking bloke, good family man, and he's made a few mistakes. He's had a couple of really well known mistakes that he's had to live with and navigate through, and you know that was tough too for all of us because he was a really clean skin, and then obviously had a uh, a couple of um, things that came out in the press that weren't great with cocaine and stuff. So, you know, but. He's worked through all that, and and he's a, he's a good man, really good man. Another high profile guy that um, you represented, who had a really sad end to his career, um, Boyd Cordner. That was tough. That I, I imagine that would have been. That was one of the. If I'm honest, that was probably because he still had a number of years to go, and he's 28, wasn't he? Yeah, on his contract, um, and also... And a, a 28, Australian, Australian New South Wales captain, captain of the Roosters. Yeah, it, you know, he just, in recent years, he, that one year he was the only one in history, I think, that had won an Origin Series, a Premiership, and an um, International Series, and mm. as captain of all. Um, and you know, Boyd, he's a cracking person, a lovely guy. He's a, he's a jet. Um, but it was really hard for him, and, and because I think... When you retire on your own terms, you get to choose, but he sort of didn't really get to choose. He he had a choice to make in the end, but it was no choice because it was made for him about his health and his life and, and quality of life and, and the risks involved with... So, um, and I know that he... I, I, I don't begin to understand some of the moments he would have gone through and he tried to verbalise a little bit and we all tried to support him, his friends and family and... But um, yeah, it it was really tough. But it was how, how involved w- were you in that? Thing? Pretty involved, yeah. Um, he he opened up on a fair few things along the way, so I knew to you, pet, yeah, 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 yeah. He had, and um, and I knew he was doing it tough when he was getting headaches and different things, and yeah, it was really hard. And then even the return to train process, and then am I going to be able to play? It was it was yeah, it was um, a lot of question marks and. I didn't really know what was happening or going to happen, and he didn't either. And so you, in the back of the mind, is this it? Is this not? And also, that insecurity about well, what's next at, yeah. at twenty eight? What do I do yeah, now? Yeah, the club was fantastic with Boyd. Um, the Roosters, the Roosters have been a really proactive club in that head injury space, and and they've probably to their own detriment to some point because they've made everyone aware of of their guys who've been. So then it's really. Not swept under the cup, which is how it should be. Whereas, you know, we, we all know, I know when I played in the 90s and well before my time it was worse in the 80s and 70s, it was a badge of honour to continue playing and you wouldn't have come off and the old smell insults and all that sort of stuff. So we've evolved a long way and we need to look after our brains and our players' brains and, and Boyd's um, an example of that. And, yeah, it was really tough at the time, but he, um, you the way he handled it, I thought, was, yeah. was fantastic. And I remember um, the day he retired and... And then we, and, and a few of his good friends again, Todd and Wade Graham, and they came down and, and he announced his retirement. And um, yeah, we went out to, to Bronny and had a feed with the 10 of us. And it was uh, sad, but it was um, celebrating a pretty remarkable. Oh. He was an amazing footballer and a tough human. You know, as, as you played the game as a warrior, he, he would respect that warrior in him. He was a, he was a good man. Well, he is a good man, but yeah. we're Fantastic rugby league player. And have it taken away when you're at the pinnacle. He had to deal with a lot. Yeah, so it was tough. I, and it, uh, I think something like that, it, it requires a lot of um, the ongoing work. 
Yeah, it does. Because really, like, and he's still. Yeah, he'd probably uh, still be playing now, wouldn't he? Like oh, he could he, still be playing. Yeah, yeah, he'd still be contracted. Yeah. Yeah, like for next year. Yeah, he was contracted for twenty three. Yeah, it's crazy. Did he ever smash you? Probably. Probably. No, we played against each other enough, so you don't remember. <laughs> it's kind of the careers. It's it's one big blurry memory. A yeah, lot it of it, is. like for for each club. It's like oh, that was yeah. This matches. It's a bit. It's all big. All a big blur. Good blur though. Yeah, that's good. Good blur. Um, speaking of me, you brought me over from England, Dave. Um, was the apprehension for an untried English player? Nah, didn't have a doubt. I remember. No, but I mean, like when you speak. Uh, no, no. I remember when I was first spoke to you. I don't know if you remember this, because I was managing a couple of boys at your club, and you were pretty young, and and you had an agent, Charles. Mountfield. Yeah, that's great. Well, and Charles great memory. Fella. And you told me because I remember we just went out socially because I was over there catching up with hoops and um, we went out socially. Yeah, we might have had a beer somewhere, James. Probably. I think it was after the Point. challenge cha- after the Challenge Cup final. You came to our yeah I'd, I'd yeah be, day two celebrations yeah, at the Hope and Anchor Pub, if I recall <laughs> correctly. Right. It's not down now, unfortunately. Yeah, it was good, but I remember meeting you guys, and I met you and Wilco and a few of the and you uh, Wello because you're good mates with with Jason Hooper and Jason Kalis, who I represented, and I was still relatively younger then as an agent and um, as a person and. Uh, and you were all good cracking fellas, and you told me it had an agent. And then I remember the following year, I was out in England again. I come out every year. I come out for about 18 years in a row. And um, I came out, and I was speaking to Wilco at a magic round. And he said, hey, will you give me a bit of a hand? He, John Wilkins, he said, if I go to Oz. And I, so I signed John Wilkins as well, just not for his English stuff, for his Australian stuff. And he said, because Charles was finishing up, your, your manager wasn't finishing up. So the next, as soon as I left, I rang you and um, and just said, hey, mate, can we catch up for a beer? I've heard Charles left. And you said, yeah. And then we met at that pub. And In Ormsgay. Yeah. yeah. And I wasn't sure you were there. The, sand, I saw, the sand I saw your car with James Graham all over oh it, big God, red and white. That was, yeah, that you, was you wouldn't r- drive that. A horrendous sponsor car, that. <laughs> but it was free. I yeah. was very grateful for a free car. But, geez, they stitched me up. Well, everyone knew where you were. You wouldn't have been able to sneak that around. That was... A, a stitch up, but no, I remember it was the sandpaper in Ormsgate. Yeah, when I met you, and we had a that was where the the wheels were in motion. Motion, but you you had unlike a lot, and and not being disrespectful, because I'd had a few guys over the years who'd who almost dual signed back then, because there wasn't as many agents in England, but they signed to come to to Australia. James Raby and that were all looking, and different guys were looking. Um, and I knew a few guys, Lee Brads and different guys, and, and they all longy, they all wanted to come to Australia, but they didn't really, if you know what I mean. But you, you said, I'm going to the NRL. That's my goal. I want to prove that I can mix it with with the best in the NRL week in, week out. So you, you were, it wasn't about if you'd go, it was when. Mm. And I, you know that, you don't know, your wife and your family, you get that look, <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. look that... It's probably really frustrating at times for people because you're not going to change once you're on that mm. that stubborn bastard look that yeah. you have. And you gave me that's the first time I saw it. And I thought, and I knew obviously I'd represented Ian Millwood, who'd coached you there, and, and the way those guys and the guys like Jason Hooper spoke about you and your toughness and your leadership and a bit of a nutter as well. So it was in the position you played, which was probably handy. So I never had a doubt, mate. I was um, excited. And then Peter Mile Holland actually probably, because we had quite a fair bit of interest. Remember you came out and you stayed with us at, in Wollongong and then you went and um, did a f- bit. And I think the Bulldogs sent, um, he went up north, stayed at... That's right, in, yeah. And it was good. But they, they were really just the most proactive, weren't they, the Bulldogs? Mm. They were just really, you were their man. Actually, I remember at the time on the market, um, oh, what's his name? The front rower, Adam, Adam Blair. Blair. Yeah. From, he was mm, on the market yeah. and a lot of clubs had their toe in the water with Adam Blair and you. And a few of them were, we're going to go Blair. If we don't get Blair, we'll go Graham or vice versa. But the Bulldogs just went, no, nah, we're going James Graham. Mm. And they went all in, didn't they? They went all in with their cell, with their with everything. And it was yeah. just like, well, oh, you're going to end up a Bulldog. And they presented really well. And Yeah, they did. Yeah. They did. They, uh, yeah. It was good that I had you. I, I think... You know, I, I couldn't have done it. Well, sorry, I could have done it, but it would have just been way more difficult. Like, I didn't know 
Like I watched the NRL on, on TV and I had a goal to get there, but I probably didn't realise just how it all works. Yeah, it's pretty intense. Like, hey? It's just, it's same, same, but very different. Like it's just, it's just different. E- even that, I can remember, we had, we had him on the podcast, meeting Todd Greenberg, the CEO. And I was just like, all right, the C- like the CEO, because the CEO at St. Helen didn't do the deals. It was the chairman, Amy yeah, yeah, Manis. Yeah. So I'm thinking like, all right. And, and Todd's talking as like, he's the big dog, but I, pu- I didn't realize yeah. he was the big dog. Like he's talking about this stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, is the chairman going to come in? Because obviously it's a, it's yep. a different system over there. Where some clubs, yeah, the chairman at the Roosters makes most of the decisions. Yeah, but you, know, but but that's what, but because that's what was all I've known. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm just like, the CEO seems like pretty into this. Like, yeah. it's just different. Again, like I, I didn't know, and I probably didn't know about. But it was big. What about all? The, I learned a lot too, mate. Just about the visa and moving oh. to the other side of the world and all that stuff and. And it was um, yeah, it was a bit of a buzz because you were sort of there'd been a couple of Englishmen come and go, but mm. I think you paved the way for a fair few of your countrymen as well. Uh, I, um, I d- well, I, I don't know, I don't know about that, but it was um, I'm I remember uh, having that determination to come, and then even meeting with St Helens chairman, and he put an offer to me. I was like, look, mate, I'm with all due respect, Damon, like I, I don't even need to see it, but he wrote it down anyway, mm. and I was like, look, that that's. Slide it over. <laughs> yeah, similar to that. I was like, look, I, I really respect it, but I, my, my, my heart's... I'm glad you came, because I wouldn't have got a commission on the St. Helens DLC, so that was probably... Help put my kids through school. And that. Yeah, maybe you'll use, like, subliminal messaging to make me want to go. <laughs> Don't say there. Look at the yeah. weather. <sighs> it's, been like, really? it's been like England here lately. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, no, it was... I, I was Really happy to get here, and obviously, um, yeah, I think it I like to think it worked. I, I was always determined to to go and answer the question, "What if?" We well, did. Like, what, what, what if? And so, so I, sorry, I didn't want to have the question, "What if?" You know, I didn't want to look back in ten years' time, twenty years' time, and go, "Oh, what, what would have happened if I'd have gone?" I think I knew the path I was on. Should I had I stayed at St Helens, mm. which was going to be great, came through with a lot of the players. They were all really close, and you know, St Helens are the most successful team in England in the Super League era, so... Oh, they're amazing. You know, as an agent, though, your finish was is really pleasing for me. And you talk about as an agent wanting for your... You know, because there's a commercial reality, like, in, in everything, you know, that's that's your job, that's what you get paid for. But there's, there's personal interest and feelings, and for you to finish the way you finished for me gave me a massive buzz, the way that we were able to get out of St George in the last year to go and finish at St Helens and win a grand final. It was, um, especially because you'd lost so many over there, so many finals. It was, and um, two over here, yeah. Yeah, it, it, was, yeah. A, it was a bloody buzz. Mate, was it, it was, was a buzz for me, yeah. not, not as much as for you, but it was a buzz for me to see you get to finish that way. Because it's, like we said, look at Boyd um, with you being forced, and there's other guys who finish in the lower grades or just don't get signed. or fin- So we don't always get to choose our... so. You're one of the lucky ones, which makes me oh, feel mate. good as an agent. And then, then to be able to transition into, you know, working with the Dragons, now you, you know, working with different clubs and working with the, the media, it's it's good. So I can sort of go, well, that worked out well. You know, that's that's good. Oh, well, mate, I'm so grateful for that opportunity to go back. Um, yeah, I can't stress that enough. Like that opportunity to f- to finish like that, and then, yeah, you know, rugby league is. It's been my world and my life since I was seven and a half years of age, and it looks like it's going to continue to do that as well. And it's uh, there's not a day goes by that I'm not in some form grateful for the opportunities that the game yeah. has given me, and and with you know some hard work and some dedication will continue to give me as well. Yeah, that's good. It's, um, it's a that's a buzz. it's pretty special for you know for just a kid from Liverpool, with yeah. Liverpool, England, but. You know, didn't know anything about rugby league when he was born, or up until the age of seven and a half, for it to dominate your life yeah, it's in, a, in a good right? way. It's, yeah, it's good. yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade any of it, mate, for for anything. I would never roll that dice. Just, yeah, very um, pleased with with how life worked out, and yeah. like like it looks like it's going to work out as well. Um, 
So yeah, well, thank you for being a you part never, of that. I appreciate that. You didn't give me any grey hairs, Jamie. You were all right. <laughs> a, oh, yes. I'll give you a chapter in the book. <laughs> <laughs> See what comes out then. <laughs> well, l- less said the better. Um, <laughs> what are the few other clientele that you have that's at the Bulldogs at the moment um, and talking all three things cross-code switches? Matt Burton. He's got a year in his favour. Yep. So technically, he's off contract. He's now. available. Yeah, he's off contract now. Um, I can only assume the dogs are in big to keep him. The dogs have been great. That, being honest, the dogs have been fantastic with Matt. Uh, he's enjoyed the move. It was a tough move, but it was sort of a move that had to be made because he wants to play. He wants to play five eight. Yeah, and he's always wanted to play five eight. He proved a pretty handy centre when he got centre of the year and won a comp, um, and he's proved that in you know even playing for Australia, he's he's a utility. He's a rugby league player. He can play anywhere. That that kid. Um, he's a kid from Dubbo who's really respectful and humble and remembers where he came from. Um, his family's lovely. Uh, he's just easy going guy. Um, he's happy at the Dogs. He likes the new coach. Uh, the Dogs have been really good. We just got a process to work through. Um, and, you say and he's a rugby league player. Is Australian Rugby Union a possibility or even the NFL? I'll, like, I, I'll, no, I'll level with you, Dave. If he goes to the NFL, I'll be pissed off with you. What year? At any point. What about when he's finished at footy, go to 35? Can he go there? Oh, yeah, yeah. let him go. No, 35, I don't cool. want you upset yeah, with yeah. me. No, I just, if he goes for a specialist kicker, like his bombs are insane. Yeah. But for that, for, for him to go to the NFL just for that. Yeah, he'd kick. Like, Look, um, that's not on our radar at this stage. Uh, rugby yeah. union, there has been, you, when I say at this stage, it's, it's not on the radar, but yeah. you never say never with yeah. something like that. And, and so if, just, just back to the NFL, would, have, has, has there been an approach? Oh, there have been approaches to do the trials and all that stuff. You know, the, so the, and the, the, scouts. Com, the combine, is it? Yeah, do the stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Com- yeah, and kick, but he's not, we're not, that's not on our agenda. He could do it tomorrow the way he kicks a ball. But he, he wants to play footy. Yeah, yeah, that's my, that's and my he's, point. And he's only young, and yeah. he's, he's got goals. As I said, it's a bit like Carmichael. The goals haven't been achieved. He's played Origin this year. He's played for Australia. But he wants to be a starting player in Origin... One day at number six, hopefully. One day in in um, the Australian jersey. So he's got those sort of goals, and and he wants to help the Bulldogs, you know, revive from where they are. So, you know, um, there's a process to work through, and and I'm not doing my job yeah. if I don't look what commercial opportunities there are for him. Yeah. But but for Bulldogs fans and for Bulldogs faithful, unless it goes horribly askew, I, 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 there'd be no reason. Provided they can come up with a market value, with his market value, which I can't see any reason why they wouldn't or won't. And we've had some really positive talks. We began talks a few weeks back and everything's really positive. It's actually probably been slower than normal because Matt's been away and I'm yeah. not going to ring him while he's on his first ever tour and talk about his contract. We've, we've had three or four, <laughs> we've had three or four conversations while he's been away and, and I did tell him I'll ramp it up a bit as it gets on and hopefully have some some things for him when he gets back to, for us to discuss and move forward. But you know me, James, I'm not, the time frame isn't, it's not, not like, over. yeah, and, and, and it's not like, oh, I'm, he's going to sign any else. No one needs to, this November one, well, no, it's after November one. Sure Phil Gould's not worried about that. Yeah. I'm not worried about that. Gus is a really good operator with, with that club. And, um, and, you know, I met with Cameron the other week, Seraldo, and he's impressive. I've known Cameron for a few years anyway. He's an impressive guy and he's, him and Birdo get on really well. So. so when the NFL come knocking, like, do you just call up Matt Burton and say, they, they want you to go to this combine? And he just goes, no. Uh, not yet. No. But something down the track. But, you but do you actually have that conversation with him? Yeah. Yeah. He, he kick, can kick a ball. Oh, I know. Why didn't you learn to kick? We could have got another couple of years. I know, if only. What about the, um, <laughs> that, like, I find that fat, like, I'd just love to know, like, who calls you up? Like, whose call is it? Sometimes just I can't remember the guy's name from the first one. The the ARU the same they came. Um, said they'd love to be involved, but you know it's probably not where he is. To switch codes at this stage in his career. He's not got that appetite. I think he's got some business he wants to take yeah. care of in the sport he's grown up loving. Mm. 
you know, I remember speaking to his mum when he got picked for Australia the other week and she said, like, he always walked around in an Australian number six, the old kangaroo's jersey when he was six years old. Or I can't remember what, age, six, seven years old. Still got it, like his little nephew that's wearing it now, you know. It's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. And that's the type of stuff, you know, like when you're Captain England and, you know, you, you achieve lifelong dreams. That's what I said at the start for me. Like, I'm happy with my career, but I would love to do a couple more things like that that didn't happen for me. But... But for, you know, seeing players achieve those goals, it's pretty special. And that's why there's still that... That's the great thing about the game is just, you know, yeah, you can make a good living and talk about money and salary cap and all that stuff, but at the end of the day, it's not enough money to do what you do to your body and that if you don't love it. Yeah. It's a great game. And there's great rewards in that game. You know, and when you're achieving those things, you're not thinking, oh, geez, this is great. I'm getting paid X amount of dollars. You look back at that and go, well, how good is it to be paid good money to do something I love? But yeah. but if that becomes the motivation, that makes it a lot harder, I, I believe. Mm. The motivation has to come because it's a tough game. It's a tough game. You've got yeah. to want to play it. The contact She doesn't miss. Yeah. It's interesting you say that about Matt Burton in a number six jersey for Australia. I don't know if we'll see that. He'll have to be pretty lucky to land in the six because of the way... That the current number system is working. <laughs> like, you will be 41. Yeah. <laughs> Before Do you think Latrell Mitchell dreamed of playing number eight for Australia? <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Although Latrell Mitchell could play anywhere. He, well, he, he could do. He's probably one of the best it, players I've ever seen. He could is. play number eight if he had to. When he, it, and it, he'd do some damage it's there as just, well. He's a freak. It's just weird. Yeah, it is. I, kn- I know they're playing the same positions, but it just doesn't I hate play. it too. I don't, does anyone, has anyone... Who actually came up with that idea? Has that been publicised? Well, I think... I think it was Mal's way of being fair. So I think Tedesco gets one because he's captain, and then it goes in cap order. Do you reckon it's because he didn't want to name a number seven? Well, you said that, Dave, not me. Um, I'd say there's a fair chance of that. Mm. So maybe Matt Burton will be Australia's number 20. What, what, what's he playing? I don't. I can't even remember what he's playing. Is he 12? No. Nah. No, nah, he wouldn't be 12. Yeah, he'd be towards the back end. No, but he'd be the higher end of the back end because there's heaps of debutants yeah, and he's a B. B-A. I, like I think there's about 12 debutants, isn't there, over there? Yeah, so he could be like... I reckon he's 12. Yeah, he could be 12. Under 24. I don't know. I can't... Tell you what, that... Um, Probably should know that. That that little... Is it a tri-assist that he gave to Adokar? Or is Adokar his own tri-assist? No, a tri-assist through the legs and then Adokar... Yeah, kick but is Adokar... Does he get... Does, does Matt Burton get a tri-assist for that? Probably not, because Adokar had to kick... Does Adokar it. kick from himself? But if Matt Burton doesn't flick it back in, there's no kick on, because he's... Tri-involvement. Yeah. A TA. You used not to try. Not a you used to claim choices when you pass from dummy half. Try involvement. <laughs> Fair yeah, enough. Not a TA, a, a TI. But Matt Burton, anyway, he's going all right, and he's a good young fella, cracking yeah. and Dubbo boy knows where he's from. That that little assist was. Yeah, Schmidt. It, it was pretty special. It was the highlight of that game because it was. Uh, it's like the old tunnel ball. Did you play that? No. Hey ben. <laughs> what did you do in England? Did you play anything, as kids? Tunnel, we played Tunnel of Death. You don't want to play that. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, he's a hell of a player, and I uh, hope you know, a lot of Bulldogs fans listen to this, and I'm sure they'll be delighted to hear you talk about him. Um, before we get on to some of the, the coaches that you manage, Dave, probably I skipped this a little bit earlier, but talked about some of the, the big names that, that, we've, uh, that you've represented. But what's it like when you're telling a player that you know it's the end there is no there's nothing out there it's hard players take it differently too it depends where they see themselves um some players will get it others will think they're hardly done by i might think they're hardly done by end of the day it doesn't matter what i think if if the market's not providing those options sometimes they'll blame us as an agent Sometimes I was going to say, do you, ever, do you ever cop the blame? Oh, yeah. Like you're Especially not shot, with you're guys not. that haven't probably kicked. And, and you know what? There's sometimes guys who probably should have kicked. And for whatever reason, I, I can't explain, they haven't got a deal. And you see players who you think are actually not as good as them at other clubs or other agencies getting deals. And you think, how did, how did they sign that bloke? This bloke's better than him. But it just doesn't happen. Do you think you that's know? people being in bed with... Oh, People sometimes and sometimes, mate, it's just subjective though, isn't it? Yeah. So each recruitment person sees things differently and with what they're trying to do within their roster and the way they want to play. So it makes it hard. 
And I look at a guy, some guys have to move over. Like Jay Field never really got the shot. He should have got it. The Dragons, I believe, I thought he was a real talent, but never even got that, just that six weeks to have a crack and see if he could establish himself. So in the end, he's had to go to England and Wigan and then look at the year he had this year. He's unbelievable, like world class. Yeah. Got them home in, you know, game after game after game. And I go, how isn't Jay playing in Australia? But anyway, he'll rebuild himself. Like a bit like Jackson Hastings. Jackson probably had a couple of off-field things that um, were different to Jay. Jay just never got that opportunity here. Hopefully he gets it one day or maybe he won't. Maybe he'll go... Remember Jacob Miller years ago went to same couldn't get an opportunity in in Australia and he's been in England for eight or nine years playing at Wakey and now just gone to Cass, so yeah it's just got to take what you what comes up at the time. But players, some players don't handle it well. Others no, I bet they bet they don't, mate. Like you, you take it incredibly personally and mm. and some don't want to let go because they you know they don't know what else to do. Well, if, if you've got established players who've had contracts year after year after year, not all of them can go into the media, not all of them can go into club land, not all of them. So some of them, you that know. That anxiety would kick in. Mate, like, I, I felt it when I was finishing playing when I was, didn't know what was mm. coming around the corner. But yeah. perhaps I needed that anxiety and level of nervousness about my future to actually kick me into gear. If yeah. I'm just like, oh, I'll be all right. You know, they yeah, don't come, they don't come knocking at your door saying, "Do you want to do this?" You got to, no, got to go and right. chase opportunity, and that that. And you got a wife and children, and that too. Yeah, yeah, you, but, you, and that you, pressure, you. like that, almost helps you in a way. I think. But it must be it must be difficult dealing with the, the emotional side of it, and it that's is. you know, we all think we're going to get the fairy tale, but seldom you do. No, no, that's true, mate. It's really hard. And all you can do is address it and be honest. And and the, the sooner you know where things are and the more honesty that's involved, the easier you can move to the what's next, whatever that may be. Yeah. So sometimes you're just waiting for... I actually like clubs keep you more to keep you hanging on on a different player. Sometimes it's a relief when you get a no even so you know what you can do next because when you're, yeah. in, when you're in no man's land, it's like you're hanging on. <laughs> Still waiting, making the same calls day after day, hoping that it gets sorted. It's tough. Uh, are the clubs using the um, the lack of the finalisation of the CBA and the salary cap to their as an excuse at the moment? Not really. Or it's not? more. I don't like how it's not a definite number myself. Yeah. I just think they should have to sign thirty, and then I, th- I think like you know how you, you can have twenty six to a date, then have to have so many by different dates, and and there's different compliance along the way. I'd rather just bang, sign your 30, get them done. They need to be done by November. Your 30 are done. If, if worst case, you have to up one of your young fellas from development, do that. Maybe leave those spots open. If you can, you've got training trials you can leave open. I just think it, the clubs play that system a bit too much, which yeah. leaves players. Because they're the tough end of the market. The guys training trialling, 80K, 60K, they're the tough end of the market that they get squeezed. Yeah, and um, and that's really hard. You know, you, for every player who gets an extra twenty, thirty, fifty to stay at up the high end, some poor guy is getting a hundred grand instead of one hundred and twenty or whatever at the lower end. Yeah. It makes it you know, that extra twenty thousand for a player on a hundred is huge compared to a player on six hundred who gets an extra twenty thousand and loses half in tax and fees and superannuation, yeah. <laughs> all that anyway. So, mate, you speak at some. Obviously, some tough, tough conversations, but you also manage some uh, some coaches as well. There's only 17 head coaches jobs and 34 assistants, if my math is yep. correct. Obviously, that's here in the NRL. How different is it looking after a coach? Coaches have been more... Um, so Most of the guys I've represented or do represent, they've been my friends, guys I've played with or... So it's more a mate thing, like Paul McGregor and Dean Pay and, and Craig Fitzgibbon was a client as a player. Um, but yeah, I, I've learnt you do the termination on the way in. So basically one thing I've got decent at is I've done the termination clauses at the start of the contract, which you'd find it, which is really quite weird because you're all in a positive thing. Coach has got the job and I'm arguing about if you sack him, what you're going to give him. 
because every coach is just waiting to be sacked. It's the stress those guys go through. It's horrendous. I um I look at what Paul McGregor went through, uh, close hand, and you know his father was ill at the time, and that's when we just said, mate. I said, mate, you need to you need to jump, get a payout, get sorted, and go on because of COVID he couldn't see his dad who was really yeah. crook, and he said it's not worth it for six or eight weeks hanging around waiting to see what's going to happen. And he's a fantastic coach. Mary works so hard. They all work so hard nowadays. Um, but yeah, it's you know they reckon you're not a fully fledged coach till you've been till you've been sacked. And looks true, doesn't it? There's not many that haven't. No. Um, you know, Wayne Bennett's been sacked. Tim Sheens has been sacked. I don't think Craig Bellamy has, but most of the others have. You know, what, with, with Mary, how much are you speaking with? Not just him, but are you having much dialogue with the board and the CEO? Is like. Uh, someone comes under so much scrutiny. A little bit, yeah, end. especially when stuff was happening and it was, I just thought they handled it weird, you know, when he wasn't even allowed to pick his own team and stuff like that. So that was a weird one with Mary. Um, yeah, it just depends. A lot of the coaches, you almost say you break their deal. It's not as probably hands-on as players, I don't find, because coaches are more, they're generally older, more experienced, They've got a lot of their other areas of their life pretty sorted. Sometimes with, with players, you know, some players, you know, we start managing them at 15, 16, they, they're coming out of school, that you know, they, they don't even have a bank account. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to teach and be involved in, in things from, from day one, whereas the coaches have been around the block as most of them have been involved in the game at, for a long period of time. So it's probably a more um, equitable discussion at different times. Um, and, you know, with the young player, you're starting with them and their parents and then they evolve and then they do more and then at the end of it, you're hoping that they're in control of their own finances and their own lives. Coaches have sort of got that bit out and you're more just... A bit like you said before, I think a lot of these guys are really equipped. Some of the coaches that have got opinions and on, on doing deals and being part of that process, but they don't feel comfortable sitting down with their bosses yeah. and the people they have to work through closely on salary cap, on everything day to day, what's happening in the club, in that they don't feel comfortable negotiating that salary conversation. It's difficult. Yeah, but, yeah. So that's yeah. why I think they get a third party to do that. Yeah. When you've got a coach in a club, do you look after them and favour players to go there? No, I don't favour players, but, you know, you'd want to help them if you can. So you look positively on them, and if, if you know the people who I represent, I've got a lot of faith in those guys as people, more than anything. So you're comfortable knowing the, the play. If you put a player to that club with those guys in charge, you know guys like Dean Pay and Paul McGregor and Craig Fitzgibbon and they're upstanding men. So I've no qualms putting a player there. But at the end of the day, you've got to do what's best for your player. Mary's yes, one of my yeah. Mary's one of my best mates, and I represent him. One of the first things I did when he got the job at Saints was move Brett Morris to, to the Bulldogs. <laughs> he was the only international at the time. Mary's going, what are you doing to me? But then when Mary knew what the deal was for Brett Morris and where he stood at Saints and where he was a bit stale there and the deal from the Bulldogs was too good and play with his twin brother and I think he wanted to play with that mad Englishman at the time. And <laughs> yeah, But you know what I mean? So yeah. so Mary respected that and, and, and allowed that to happen for Brett to move on. But it was his... He was at the time was the only international in the Dragons team and I moved him on. But it wasn't about Mary or me. That's where you have to be honourable and you have to be um, not biased. You have yeah. to be completely impartial. What, impartial, what's best for your client. Um, with some of the, um, well, one of the, the complaints around player agents is when they have too many players at one club. Is that is that dangerous for you, or is that just? I've never really is that been just in that situation because the better clubs they mix it up anyway. Like there have been some instances where one or two agents have used their own power for their own thing. There's a couple of agents out there who love that, mate. I don't need to say, and say their names. Everyone knows who they are, and then they try and get power in the club. And I've never understood that. But those agents obviously have some, you know, mother issues or ego issues, and never never achieved in the game or never. And and that's what's detrimental. It goes back to the original thing. Why do people think bad of agents? In sometimes it's a bit like sometimes with lawyers, because some lawyers have behaved poorly. Everyone thinks our oh, lawyers are bad, but there have been some agents, and have recently. That's why you know some of them have been banned, and some of them have been, um, you know, they're looking at different rules around coaches and different things because people have acted in, the, in an improper manner. 
which is disappointing, but that's that's the way it is. And I was still amazed. They, even though clubs still have a choice, yeah. they don't have to let – just because they sign a coach who's represented by a certain agent. And, you know, this has been well documented. Three or four clubs have gone sort of south when they've let the agent basically run their club. And they have a choice not to let that happen. So I don't really blame the agent completely. If they're silly enough to let him do it, well, yeah, you know, the clubs have to look at themselves. And there's uh, been a, you know, a couple of clubs that's happened to in recent times. How, how do you have it where you've got, say you're representing two or three coaches and there's one job, and two of them are interviewing for the job? At the end of the day, the club will pick. So that's not really... So you, then you, you just... Play a straight back. I've never really had that. I had that because I, I used to help out Jimmy Dimmick, who was a good mate of mine, and Dean at the same time. Mm. And I actually... Oh, Jim, yeah, they both were going for the yeah, dog's job, yeah. The dog's yeah. job. And Jim and I had a conversation, and he, he went and got different representation for that because he, Dean and I had been in business together and we're really close mates. And Jimmy and I were really good mates too, and still are to this day, but it was probably easier for me to step away so there wasn't that conflict. So that's what I did there. Mm. On Dean Pay, how come he only gets one chance when others seem to get a multitude of opportunities? I don't know. I'd love him to get another chance if we can put that out there. Let's maybe we should use the media and get him a job. He he um, he was. I remember escape- speaking to he to was a scapegoat. Josh Hodgson and 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 Elliot down at Canberra and they loved them. Oh, it's a fantastic. And then he comes to the Bulldogs in a you know a bad time and that's it. It's bizarre, mate. I think he will come back in some capacity. I think yeah. he'd be a great assistant coach for someone with his knowledge and his expertise. Um, he's just a cracking guy. And Dean's one of those, he's not a real big man, similar to yourself, but he was tough. And he's a tough, uncompromising man in a good way, you know what I mean? He's solid, he's a real family man, he's got respect, he doesn't talk unless he's got something to say, and he's, yeah, you could not speak highly enough about that man as a person and as a coach, really, because he's, he's, he's about his players and he's about people. And um, unfortunately, he got thrown under the bus at the Dogs Heavy um, at a time when they're bored and that was all over the shop and, and Dean was the scapegoat. And look, what they did after Dean, they didn't really do any better, um, if anything. So I felt felt for him there. I um, That was a tough time too, really tough time what he went through and I think he was pretty badly burned. I don't know if he wants to be a head coach again, but I'd, he definitely wants to be in rugby league again and he'll be a value added, huge value add to some club in... Yeah. In the next year or two, I'd reckon. Yeah, good. Good to hear. Um, mate, we're nearly at the end. I've just got some quick-fire questions for you. Um, Sweet. Are there any clubs that you don't like to work with? Uh, not, there's none I don't like to work with. There's some you probably do more work with because they're easier to work with, with with how they're organised and their systems. Can you name them? No, nah, that's not very nice. You can work it out. Have a look at our website. <laughs> 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 That's a great point, yeah. No one at this team. Um, what do you really enjoy about the job? What's your favourite thing about being a sports agent? I get con- to control my own time a little bit, which is fantastic, but the best thing is seeing people achieve. Pe- goal-orientated people achieve their goals. It's it's a bit of a buzz, and especially in the game I love and, and came through and played, so that's pretty cool. Not free tickets? No, I'm over that. I don't go. Right, Super Saturday, watch at home, it's good. Because you can, and you know what, with the venues now, it's harder to get around. You don't often see even see your players after the game. So, um, yeah, no, tickets don't bother me. I'm not that buzzed on that. But, yeah, the game itself is um, still great and seeing people achieve. So when, when, when a guy like Burton makes his, his first rep thing or, you know, when a young Aaron Shop makes his first grade debut or things like that, like this year, James Schiller in Canberra and got that young Morcos who went and played for Lebanon in the in the uh, World Cup, and he's going to come back. He'll play first grade at some stage this year, I reckon. They, and I coached him when he was, like, 12. and so There's a buzz in that sort of stuff, so it's cool. What's your biggest dislike? Oh, just the... Uh, there's a lot of shit in the game at times, that bullshit and that that goes with. I, I dislike that, and a little bit underhanded and stuff. Sometimes I wish things could be just to be a little bit more open. Where am I on the needy scale as a client? 10 being the most neediest person, one being the, the most, the least neediest person. Oh, you fluctuate. Depends what you need. 
you're probably um if, I, i'm just going to remind you dave this is a quick fire question <laughs> yeah i just don't want to say the wrong thing you might might sack me no nah, quick fire no you're a seven on the high end yeah that's in a good way my, my bigger clients you'd want to talk to and there's more stuff to do from so i'm okay with that okay when gal's off contract he's a 10. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to put seven and just go question mark future. <laughs> Maybe five. <laughs> um, Taron's a three. <laughs> yeah. Do you lose many players? No. And what's it like when you do? Oh, it's life. It upset me more when I was younger. The reason. But sometimes there's some people, you know, I've let a few go because they're just not my people. They're not my type of person and I'm not right for them. There's different style of agents for different style of people and I... You know, if some want the car salesman type, that's not me. Others want the experience of playing, and that, that's me. And communication, that's important to me. And, um, you know, I don't lose many at all, mate, but a couple I have. Yeah, there's been a couple I've been disappointed with and a couple that are good riddance. Fair play. Um, how much work do you need to put in to the job of being a successful sporting agent? Oh, it's 24-7 heavy especially in the early like years junior to, carnival to get established yeah but see, now yeah. obviously i've got a network and i can pay other people to be at different places but when you're first starting you, you know you get, it's just your own legwork because um, i'm surprised your phone's not gone off throughout this whole process it's up there on silent yeah so it's probably but, have be, but, yeah your stuff going on like it's not it's it's a 24 7 mm. 365 like you say you're on you're on you're about to go on the snow and no we're not no that's right and, and then I, how how frequently would you have to change plans Oh, all the time. Oh, no, you just got to take do it when you're there. And sometimes you also got to prioritise whether... Th- you got to work out whether that call is is something that can be done a little bit later. And sometimes you got to just breathe and do your own thing as well. And even with emails and that, you know, you see them on your phone and you think, oh, I've got to answer that email. And you go, well, if I hadn't seen it, do I need to answer it? Like, can I do that in two hours? Or yeah. So it's just... So you get your freedom of your own time, but you never get, you never actually get downtime. It never ends. It's 24-7. But it's people's lives too. And I... I really take that seriously and I respect that. And I know that, you know, sometimes it must be frustrating because people ring me and you, you, what happened to you? You ring me four times in a day and you haven't got me, but that's because I'm talking, I'm on the phone. I'm not, you know, and that must be frustrating. I know that would be frustrating because I know when I ring you back and you don't get it, it's like, well, why don't you answer me? I'll ring you back, but you've tried four times. So that, that's hard. That bit's hard, but I just try to make sure you get back in due time or even a text message or an acknowledgement. Hey mate, on flat chat, I'll get back to you where I can. So at least then you can go, well, the bastard's alive and he's acknowledged me. Yeah. And, so that's about it. Have you had any... What's the strangest request? Oh, I've had some weird ones over the years for people wanting objects of clothing from players or wanting... Um, strangest requests. You get a lot of weird ones wanting people to attend events, like thinking that, you know, James Graham's going to go 300k to Millie's 80th birthday, which you, you probably would if you could, but... You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's just not feasible. That's not going to happen because he plays on the fri- Friday and you want him there on the Thursday. And But, yeah, just... Yeah, but none really stand out odd, odd ones. I'll probably think of something later and go, I should have said that, but nothing nothing stands out. Later. Has anyone offered you any favours? Like... <laughs> like what? <laughs> Please explain. <laughs> I don't know. I'll do this if you do that. Yeah, I, look, over the years, and that's one thing I'm really proud of, probably there had been the odd time when someone said, you know... Oh, I would look after you, like give me something or yeah, if fly we, you over and yeah. do this and give you. No, nah, and I've never ever. But yeah, I've had there have been enticements saying if you get your play here, but it's not about me. Mm. I'll get looked after if the player's happy, and it will, and the player will get longevity and get a longer time, and then I'll be alright after that. But yeah, yeah, quite a few times, especially early in my career. Yeah, people would try and think if they could. Yeah, get you then. But you know, butter me up, then mm. they'd get the player, but. I'm sure it's happened to, um, well, I know it's happened with some agents, but no, never, no. Most bizarre clause you've seen in a deal? Uh, Canberra tried to put a complete non-drinking one in Todd Carney once, which I thought was really hard because I just said, well, what happens if he's at a 21st and he's photographed sipping a champagne? Does he get sacked? Or So there's been a couple like that. Um, there's been weight clauses. There's been weight some, clause. Yeah, a like if a player goes over a certain overweight, weight, then the yeah, contract is null and void. No, not null and void, but could be fined or oh. or um, breach notices and stuff like that. Been goal kicking clauses. There's been 
Go, how? What's a goal kicking clause? If you kick so many, a minimum fifty goals at over eighty percent or something, you might get a bonus. Or, really? Yeah, it's been some good rep bonuses that people. Matt Pry had a good one, massive increase the year after, and Freddie picked him for that one game. Thanks, Freddie. That was good. Um, goal kicking clause. Yeah, it's a different. You never had anything like that. You should have put a try scoring clause in yours. Yeah, I know. You might not have got it though. No. Any other strange ones? That really stand up. That, that I really think of. I, if I really put my head around it, it's been 22 years. Do you know what they blur? It's funny when yeah. and sometimes players ring up and go, Oh, in my contract, is there a clause? About it? And I'm thinking, Oh, God, I, I've got to look at it because it's just been that many. It's a bit like you say with the games blur, the yeah. contracts blur into one. And they, yeah, there's been some really weird clauses over the years that you try and put in. And you know, clauses that if a player plays so many games or does so many things that they kick to here and here and, and, um, you know, start so many games or all sorts of different things you try over the years to try and get an edge. And uh. yeah, all right. Well, Dave, this has been a really interesting listen for me, um, and I'm sure our listeners will appreciate going behind the scenes and looking at some of the stories from a different point of view and just That's exactly right. how the whole sports agent management agency works. It's been fantastic chat, Dave, and uh, thank you for joining us on the buyout. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me, mate. You're a good man. Cheers, buddy.